Hey everybody, welcome back. Gary Edelman, American Battlefield Trust. Here we are in Atlanta and we are getting tired. We're near the end of the road and it's also near the end of the road historically for the Confederates here at Atlanta. So we've got to bring, bring a lot up to speed here and we're going to do that in just a second. We're standing here on Copen Hill. We're east of Atlanta and we are near the historic uh, Atlanta battlefield of July 2nd, eight, July 22nd, 1864. I almost said July 2nd, 1863. I wonder why that popped into my head. But to get into this battle, before we can even fight it, we gotta bring some troops here. Let's bring on our friend Charlie Crawford, President Emeritus of the Georgia Battlefields Association. All right, let's do a little refresher. Remember, Hood takes over the Army of Tennessee, Confederate Army of Tennessee, on the 18th of July. On the 19th of July, there's a short small but sharp engagement at Greenbow Creek, not precipitated by Hood, but precipitated by the U.S. 14th Corps trying to get across Greenbow Grum Creek. Then the 20th, you have the big Battle of Peachtree Creek, which is subject to a separate video, uh, that Hood is attempting, making his first attempt, to try to push the Yankees away from Atlanta by hitting at least a part of the U.S. Army because he knows he doesn't have the strength to attack all of it all at once. So the tw at the end, toward the end of that 20 July battle, Peachtree Creek, the Confederates are trying to decide whether to make another assault when Hood gets a desperate message from General Wheeler, his cavalry commander. General Wheeler was here about where we're standing and then on down that direction to the south, guarding against the approach of another portion of Sherman's forces the Army of the Tennessee under McPherson. They had gone west of the city to Decatur, which is east of here, and then turned west toward Atlanta. And as they were approaching, the only thing standing in the way of McPherson's seven divisions is Wheeler and his cavalry. So he says, I need help. Hardy dispatches Claiborne, the reserves division he had at Peachtree Creek, to come and help Wheeler. And then on the 21st, there's a battle for what's called the Bald Hill, which is a couple miles south of here. Claiborne is roughly handled. Now, Claiborne's the, about the best guy the Confederates have, but he can't stand up to seven divisions coming from the Army of the Tennessee. So they retreat over the night of the 21st to 22nd. The morning of the 22nd, the line that runs basically from here to the south, the Confederate line, is now going to be reversed and turned into a U.S. Army trench. General Sherman approaches right up here. This is Copen Hill. He will come to this vicinity of what they would call the Howard House because the Howard family rented it, but it actually belongs to Augustus Hurt. Um, in any event, when the Federals get there, they say, whose house is this? And the people that were in it said, the Howards live here. And that's how you get the confusion between the Federal record and the Confederate records. Is it the Howard House or the Hurt House? It's the Augustus Hurt House. When Sherman comes here and looks off to the west, he can see Confederates moving south through the city. Uh, infantry and artillery, and he assumes they're leaving the city, that they're retreating. And so he, Sherman is great for constantly urging his subordinates to press on, press on, go ahead and attack, there's nobody in front of you. Sherman is wrong. What that is, is the trail end of Hardy's Corps leaving the Peachtree Creek area and heading way south, then come back up the Fayette, old Fayetteville Road to get behind McPherson. McPherson comes here with Sherman, and erase his 15th and 17th Corps from here on down. The 16th Corps gets wedged out. If all of us tried to converge on a central point, we'd eventually get close enough that we wouldn't have enough room. And that's what happened to the 16th Corps. So Sherman says to McPherson, the morning of the 22nd, with your 16th Corps, I want you to help go destroy the railroad thoroughly between here and Stone Mountain. It's the railroad to Augusta. This will be the second railroad that the Confederates lose. They've already lost the Western and Atlantic. This one's going to be thoroughly destroyed. So uh, when McPherson protests and said, I don't know what's off to my left, because Gerard's cavalry is also off looking to destroy railroads, and so my left flank is in the air. So Sherman says, OK, take the 16th Corps and put part of them down on your left flank, but if the Confederates haven't done anything by noon, then I want you to send them to destroy the railroad. About noontime, McPherson is about a half a mile south of here, having lunch with Corps Commanders Blair of the 17th Corps and Logan of the 15th Corps, when all of a sudden there's the clatter of musketry arriving from the south, 
just about at noontime. And sure enough, it's the force that Hardy has sent way south of the city to come way down here and then back up and come in behind McPherson's troops. Unfortunately, they're not gonna find an open vesta for them to attack behind McPherson's army because those two brigades of the 16th Corps are in, exactly in the way of where the attack is supposed to commence. So Sherman has come here, see the flag? He's on Copen Hill and he's looking this way and he hears the sound too. McPherson quickly races off toward the sound of guns, which is down here. Bate is going to be the first one to attack and he runs into Rice and Mersey, which he did not expect to find any U.S. Army troops there at all. Next is Walker. Won't be under Walker anymore. He gets shot as he emerges from the top of Terry's Mill Pond and he's killed. So now it's under General Mercer. Next is supposed to come General Claiborne, but he's delayed about an hour behind these guys. And then General Maney is supposed to come behind Claiborne. So again, it's sort of the do it on echelon to use the French term, hit, 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 hit. Not all at once, but in sequence. Walker's now dead. McPherson rides south and he observes from about this spot, this front becomes stabilized because Rice and Mersey and General Marl all help repulse Bate and Walker's division now under Mercer. When Claiborne hits, however, there's still a gap and Claiborne carries off the 16th Iowa and six pieces of artillery and he has success. And so the Union line begins to bend back and then Maney attacks. Unfortunately, in this case, they attack too far apart in time. And so the U.S. troops wind up actually going from one side of their entrenchments to the other, depending on whether Maney or Claiborne is attacking, because now Claiborne's coming from almost the east, Maney's coming from almost the west. In the process of hearing this new danger, McPherson rides over to observe, and unfortunately, he rides into the 5th Confederate Regiment which is a bunch of Tennesseans, but they're trying to have some sort of national branding, so they call it a Confederate rather than a Tennessee regiment. And McPherson realizes his mistake when he sees Confederate troops in front of him. He turns, and I think the story is apocryphal, but enough people have mentioned it, he actually lifts his hat as if in salute, and then turns his horse and starts to ride back towards safety. He doesn't make it. Uh, a Confederate shoots McPherson in the back and he dies either instantaneously or shortly thereafter. The confusion becomes because the only people that actually saw the very end of McPherson were captured and so it wasn't until later that the orderly said yes he lived for a little bit because the orderly said to him general are you hurt and he said I'm afraid I am orderly with blood streaming out of his chest. Okay so this fight is going on, going on, going on, at which point General Hood, who's over here in Oakland Cemetery, see the red flag there, he decides that the Corps now under Cheatham, used to be Hood's Corps, is going to attack even though this Hardy's Corps has not had the success envisioned in the plan. So that's what you'll see in the Atlanta Cyclorama is this attack by Cheatham's divisions coming in along the railroad. Now, McPherson's dead. Logan takes his place. Logan's taken McPherson's place, so then Morgan Smith takes over the division. Lightburn or takes over the Corps. Lightburn takes over the division. That leaves Wells Jones, the senior colonel, to come back and take over Lightburn or uh, Lightburn's brigade. When he comes back to the line from having been out on picket post, the other colonels in the brigade say, we're in bad shape here because there's a ravine caused by the railroad and there's so much smoke that we can't see if anybody's coming through it. And Wells Jones says, I agree with you, but it's too late because he sees the Confederates are already approaching, the Brown and Clayton and the rest of Cheatham's Corps. And what happens there is what's called the breakthrough. The Confederates actually come through the, the cut of the railroad, obscured by smoke, and they break the line here. Morgan L. Smith's division and Harrow's division. That's what you see depicted in the cyclorama is the breakthrough and the beginnings of the counterattack. Remember, Logan's now in charge of the Army of the Tennessee. There's a political general, but nobody's greater in a fight than Logan. He's very inspirational. He turned the tide at Dallas back at the end of May. He's doing it again here. And the Union troops rally and coming from here, 
Sherman up here can see across this gentle cleared valley, as he calls it, what's going on when this attack occurs. And so he turns to Schofield. The rest of this fighting is all by the U.S. Army of the Tennessee. The Army of the Ohio is up here, but Sherman turns to Schofield and says, bring me every gun you've got. By that he means every cannon. And assembled on this hill behind me, there's 23 cannons from the Army of the Ohio and the Army of the Tennessee to shoot across this general clear valley into the left flank of the Confederate attack. And so the fighting prolongs, goes on for most of the afternoon. Eventually the Confederates are repulsed. Several human interest stories go in here. I'm not going to try and tell you them all. Significantly, Walker is dead for the Confederates, a division commander. McPherson is dead for the U.S. forces. An army commander becomes the only U.S. Army commander killed during the Civil War. But at the end of the day, back into the trenches go the Confederates. They've lost the Battle of Atlanta in about 5,500 casualties. Combined with the casualties from Peachtree Creek, in Hood's less than a week on the job, he's managed to lose about 8,000 men. Confederates lose the Battle of Atlanta. Sherman loses McPherson. That's actually going to put Sherman in a pretty tight spot because what is he going to do for a replacement? Logan stepped in, does a fantastic job, captured larger than life in canvas at the Cyclorama, as we saw in an earlier uh, uh, video, except that he's not part of the West Point Club. And that's a real sticking point for Sherman as he casts about for another pot candidate for replacement, well, he could go with fighting Joe Hooker, who's done excellent work throughout this campaign as he has helped lead the vanguard in many instances in the fights leading to the, the edge of the city. He could also look to the vapid but pious Oliver Otis Howard. And I got to give Chris White the credit for that. Frank O'Reilly uh, plugs that in. And Chris and I have used it ever since because it certainly captures old prayer book perfectly. He's also another candidate. He and Hooker are both part of the West Point Club, so that's an important consideration. But as we weigh the two, we got Hooker. Great, great fight in general. He has been uh, re rehabilitating his reputation in this campaign, but that's a man who loves Joe Hooker. Can't help but shoot his mouth off any opportunity he has. He's prickly, he's contentious, he's self-aggrandizing, and we got Howard, who is absolutely tapioca, but he does what he's told to do, he follows order. And so Sherman's actually gonna tap Howard to take over, not even giving Logan the consideration. Later, Sherman will try to make that up to Logan when they have the Grand Review in Washington after the war, and he'll ask Howard to let Logan lead the army in the Grand Review, uh, appealing to uh, Howard's Christian gentlemanness, allowing him to step aside from that. But Logan gets shuffled aside here, uh, and uh, Howard's gonna get that army, and Hooker is not gonna be able to stand it. Howard's the guy that Hooker blames for the loss at Chancellorsville. Howard had that terrible first day at the Battle of Gettysburg, and now you're going to put him in charge here, and Hooker's going to ask to be reassigned and will eventually get his wish. Sir Sherman doesn't like Hooker. He'll be glad to get rid of him, even though, ironically, Sherman intentionally gave Hooker tough jobs in this campaign, counted on him. Hooker came through. Um, so we're going to have this uh, major, major command shift take place as Sherman uh, wins this battle, but he doesn't win the city. The, the Confederate defenses around the city are still pretty strong, and so now it's going to be, as Homer Simpson once said, the waiting game. And he's going to try to extend his line, drawing the Confederates out, realizing the Confederates just don't have the manpower. Very similar to what Grant's going to do outside of Petersburg. Just keep extending, 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 and force the Confederates to overextend, overextend, and see if he can find a weakness. Good. Thanks, Chris. See, I'm running out of my energy now. Uh, you know, I, I want to say before we move on, because this isn't this isn't a good thing for the Confederates and they're about to get worse. But before we get into that, I just want to say that here we've been tracing the Atlanta campaign, a campaign supposedly where there's nothing to see. It's all lost. And I think we have found something different. Although while we've gotten to Atlanta, you know, we're closer to Atlanta, there's a little bit less to see. But I would say that between our great local partners at Tunnel Hill and Whitfield County and um, at 
that at uh, Rocky Face Ridge and so many other places, the American Battlefield Trust, the Georgia Battlefields Association have been able to help to rehabilitate and, and create parks actually. And even as you get to Atlanta, you've got things you can see at Peachtree Creek and you can even see m uh, memorials to the uh, uh, deaths of McPherson and Walker. You have to be pretty savvy to find them. You can use the Atlanta, American Battlefield Trust Atlanta Battle App to get a little further on that. Now, the Battle of Atlanta is July 22nd. It's not long, and this is east of the city. It's not long before there's going to be another fight um, to the west of the city, that's Ezra Church. It's not long after that that you're gonna have a fight to the southwest of the city, Utoy Creek. And it's not long after that till you're gonna have six Union Corps. And this is what Sherman could do. This is what Sherman had been doing the whole time. He can send a bunch of corps somewhere and still have some to spare to hold the main line. And six of those corps are going to head toward Jonesboro, south of the city. This is going to be the death knell for the Confederates in Atlanta. The Confederates lash out on, I think, the last day of August. On the first day of September, the, the Union is fighting. And in the meantime, Sherman's getting ready to come into the city, and Hood will oblige him. And he will leave. On the second, Sherman marches in and famously says, uh, Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Now, of course, when it falls, we love to think of this. You know, it's Gettysburg, then it's the wilderness, and nothing happened in between. Uh, you know, after Atlanta Falls, a lot is going to happen, and we're going to cover that a lot on another video, uh, and we hope you'll watch that one and share it with your friends. But to talk a little bit about the you know, what it meant when Atlanta fell, let's bring on a new guest here. We haven't seen him yet, our good friend Todd Gross. He is the longtime president of the Georgia Historical Society, which is in itself a very longtime institution. What do you have to say there, Todd? Thank you, Gary. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today, and it's quite interesting that you should say that because many people, when they think about World War II, it's the landing in Normandy and then Berlin Falls, and there's so much that's in between that we generally jump over. So what did all this mean? Why is this important? Why all this death and destruction? Why does it matter? Well, when the Confederates lost Atlanta, they not only lost a major manufacturing and transportation center, one might even argue the most important one of the Confederacy, certainly after Richmond. But the most important thing about the fall of Atlanta is that it signaled the end of the Confederacy. It broke the stalemate that existed both in the East and in the West. In the East, Grant was suffering massive casualties, not making any progress in terms of capturing Petersburg and Richmond. And when Sherman finally captured the city of Atlanta and got the word out, it ensured the re-election of Abraham Lincoln, and that ensured the prosecution of the war all the way through to the end and the destruction of the Confederacy. So one could argue, and historians have, that the really decisive campaign of the Civil War was not Gettysburg or even the Battle of Nashville, which came later on. It was really the campaign of Atlanta, because after this, there was absolutely no way that the Confederacy could win once Abraham Lincoln was reelected. So that's the meaning of all of this. That's all the death and destruction boils down to that one thing, that Atlanta's falling ensures the end of the Confederacy. It's kind of interesting because on an earlier video, we walked through the Atlanta History Center and their Civil War exhibit is called The Turning Point. And of course, it's talking about the Civil War as a turning point in American history. But Atlanta is a major turning point in the war. In some ways, it's the point of no return. Because of course, once, as Todd mentioned, the, the city falls, Lincoln gets reelected, and he's going to see this battle through to the end. He's going to see the war through to its conclusion. That was in doubt had, Jacks, or had, uh, had uh, Lincoln lost re-election. We've got lots more coming up. We're going to then kind of take the armies out of here, get them out of Atlanta, get them through Georgia. All that's coming up in a future video. I want to thank Charlie. I want to thank Todd. I want to thank Gary. I want to thank Chris White behind the camera. And I want to thank you for all you've done to help us bring this story to you and fellow Battlefield aficionados just like you. Thank you for everything you do to support Battlefield preservation and education. <laughs>